I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. Our exploration of the use of modern data analytics to enhance investment results continues this week with two of the leading providers of tools for portfolio managers. My guests on today's show are Claire Flynn Levy and Cameron Height, both former investment managers who became entrepreneurs seeking to improve outcomes for other managers. Claire is the founder and CEO of Essentia Analytics, a service that gathers and assesses rich data to help managers overcome common behavioral biases and optimize their trading activity. Cameron is the founder and CEO of Alpha Theory, a fintech company that helps investment managers optimize their position sizing process. By creating a disciplined, real-time process based on a decision algorithm with roots in actuarial science, physics, and poker, Alpha Theory takes the guessing out of position sizing and portfolio construction. Our conversations cover the founding of their respective businesses, the mistakes portfolio managers commonly make, the tools they employ to help managers improve, and the challenges they face in broader adoption of these modern tools. Clients of Essentia and Alpha Theory have consistently demonstrated improvement in their results after employing these techniques. If you ask Claire and Cameron, you may come away with a whole new appreciation of the potential for active management and equities going forward. You can learn more about these two innovative companies at Essentia-Analytics.com, that's E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A-Analytics.com, and AlphaTheory.com. We'll start the conversation with Claire and continue later with Cameron. Please enjoy my conversation with Claire Flynn Levy and Cameron Height. Claire, thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Why don't you describe how you came to found Essentia and what your path was to get there? I was a long only tech fund manager during the internet bubble in the late 90s, and it was great. You know, everything I touched turned to gold and I won all the awards and I was God's gift to fund management. And I actually left and started a long short tech fund uh, at the uh, launch in March of 01. By then, not everything was great and everything I touched didn't turn to gold. And although I could short by that point, my approach in terms of fundamental analysis just wasn't working. That was fine, but my interest was in finding a way to improve. You know, what if this isn't working, okay, but could somebody please tell me what I should be doing differently? And nobody could tell me that. All they could say was, well, one thing that would be different would be if you made more money. Uh, <laughs> Funny how that works really in this business. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, when you're a fund manager, there's, there's a lot of other people trying to tell you how to do your job or else it, it feels like that. Really what I wanted was cold hard facts data that showed me, here's what you're good at, do more of this. Here's what you're bad at, do less of this. And and really gives me the ability to maximize my return on energy expended. But nobody could really do that. And I found that very frustrating. And without clear vision into what is my competitive advantage, really? Is it what's in my marketing material? Because we don't actually have proof of that other than my performance track record. Suddenly, I started asking myself much deeper questions about where my skills actually lay. And and I didn't have answers, and I didn't have a route to getting those answers, really. And so I packed it in and decided that I would do something totally different, if not unrelated, which was run a tech company that made portfolio management software for hedge funds. Through that experience, I saw that I was not the only one who wanted to understand how to do more of what I was good at, most of what I was. In fact, all fund managers ultimately know that their job is to make decisions. The consistency with which they can get those decisions right and the extent to which they can get the ones right, really right, and the ones that get wrong, only a little bit wrong, that is the key to success in, in fund management. So 
again, though, we couldn't provide that at, at that point. We didn't have the technology or the expertise to do the math that's required, really. Now, we launched Essentia almost five years ago now, and it was really to solve that problem that you know, I could see even through the financial crisis. I was working for a fund where the manager didn't have doubts in his own ability um, or that, you know, no suspicion. I, I don't think that his skills had disappeared, but his investors had questions. <laughs> his investors wanted to see, you know, just show me some kind of proof that everything is still working for you in, in the way that you would expect it to. Yeah. yeah. So what, what became available in the last five years uh, that mm-hmm. you're now deploying that wasn't before that? You know, it's really to do with the cloud and virtual servers and big data analytics and machine learning. You know, the fact that you can use computing power on an ad hoc basis whenever you need it to do calculations just for as long as, as they're needed means you don't have to invest in massive infrastructure. And machine learning makes it possible to, to cut right to the chase on, amongst all of this data, what are the top three insights I need to know? I don't have time to listen to chapter and verse. Just tell me what I need to know. And that has made a huge difference. When you go and talk to portfolio managers today about using Essentia's tools, what's the pitch? Depends on who we're talking to, first of all. So if we're talking to a PM directly, pitch is, are you interested in using technology to do the best possible job you can? And if the answer is, I don't care about doing the best possible job that I can, then all right, <laughs> you have bigger problems, and I will check you later. But we'll be here when you're ready to talk. Actually, what we find, though, is that there is a growing population of portfolio managers who have read a lot about behavioral finance, you know, who have taken an interest in this idea of, of bias and are aware that they have biases, but have never really been able to identify them or do anything about them. And so the pitch becomes about if you now have the ability to look in the mirror and see the truth about what is working and what is not working in data terms with no judgment, knowing that it's not going to be shown to other people, this isn't about embarrassing you, it's just about helping you. Wouldn't you do that? Why would you not do that? And if technology could then be used to remind you of what you've learned from from these insights at the moment when that bad habit starts to creep in again. So give you a sort of ex-ante prompt to use the learning in your day-to-day investment process. Wouldn't you want that? Yeah, let's break down those two components. So the first is there are behaviors that we know and sort of had a number of conversations the last couple of weeks about this with Michael Mobison and Annie Duke that get in our own way. And so how do you use data to get into the behaviors that are working and the behaviors that aren't? Well, it all comes down to what data we can get our our hands on from a given portfolio manager. We start on the assumption that the very bare minimum we can get is historical daily trades and or holdings. That's the starting point. And with that, we can basically decompose every investment that you've ever made into a series of of some decisions, no matter what you're doing, for any equity investment, you're making a picking decision, you're making an entry timing decision, you're making a decision about how big to go and how quickly to get there, and adding and trimming decisions while you're in there, and then a set of decisions on the way out about how fast to get out, when to get out, and what to switch into. And if you look at it that way and decompose every sort of investment story into those constituent parts, then you can analyze each type of decision separately and say, okay, well, let's look at exit timing. Exit timing, every fund manager knows it's hard. And and every book tells you that it's hard. We all know it's hard. However, you don't really appreciate it until you see your own exit timing in the mirror. And then what we're doing is saying, look, let's define what the exit decision is, you know, it could be about looking at just the last day of trading, like the last shares you let go of. Are you doing it early compared with what would have been optimal, given a a window of analysis that's relevant to you? Or are you doing it late? Are you doing it exactly right? And, you know, what we find is that 
the vast majority of fund managers, not surprisingly, show evidence of loss aversion around exit timing when prices have been on a, a negative trend or, or a positive one if they're short. So when the price is moving against you, the tendency is to hold on for too long and often then to capitulate at, at the bottom. And when you sort of hold up a mirror and show that to somebody, they're like, oh, God, <laughs> okay, that's embarrassing. And and the fact is, it may be embarrassing, but there's no need to be embarrassed because everyone does it. So then it's about how can we help you not do that or or not necessarily say, here's a stop loss you need to follow to, you know, always cut at a certain point, but rather to nudge you to just make a deliberate decision at this point. Here are three questions you said you want to ask yourself at that point. Here they are. Answer them. So it's, it's, it's leaving the power in the hands of the PM, which is really important. And, you know, I can appreciate having been a PM. Yeah. In addition to loss aversion, are there other specific tenets of behavioral finance that you then end up being able to map to the behavior of portfolio managers? We've, we've taken a practical approach and said, like, let's actually analyze what goes on. And then if there is a bias that we found in the literature that relates to this, great. And if there isn't, so be it. Maybe we will end up inventing <laughs> new ones based on the evidence we're gathering. We definitely do sometimes see the disposition effect as a, an extension of the loss aversion point. So not just holding on losers, on some losers for too long, but cutting winners early. Less prevalent in professional fund managers than in retail investors, though. We see overtrading, which the literature would call overconfidence, you know, thinking that I'm going to do something and the odds of that thing benefiting the portfolio are greater than 50-50, which is overconfidence <laughs> in its own way. So we see that from some people, but not others. You often see evidence of hurting around entry timing and that sort of, people are often very good at contrarian entry timing, catching a, you know an inflection point quite well. But when something's been moving their way for a while, take, say, a three-month run-up, they're, they're waiting and waiting, and then they start getting in, and they've cut the top. And showing that to them can be quite useful because they can work steps into the process that get them to ask questions of themselves about, like, are we too late? Yeah. You, know? you start with a set of tools that looks at what stock to get into, how to get in, and at what pace trading around it when you're there, should you, when do you get out, how do you get out or how fast do you get out, and then the exit and potentially mm -hmm. swap into something else. Are there other parts of the portfolio process that you're studying with the data that you gather on trading information? Well, so we're always looking at things by hit rate, payoff, and impact on the portfolio. And then what those things are, we might be looking at, you know, the, the individual skills that you just mentioned, we might be looking at just overall positions, which ones by sector, by country, by market cap, by liquidity, by a zillion other factors, which ones do we tend to get right most often and, and get most right. And then what we can do is, if you give us data about whose ideas were these or which research sources were you using or what's your risk factor scores or conviction levels or anything like that, we can bring that into the mix and then you can hone it that much finer. And then we also will look at, and for this, we don't really need any extra data. How do you behave when you're winning, you know, when you're on a roll versus when you're in the hole? That is a fascinating area, I think. And it's not something that, that anybody's really done a lot of work on in, in the industry, something that we're digging quite deep into at the moment. Um, and I think that will hopefully map to things like the victory effect and snake bite effect and, and that type of stuff. I'm also really curious about adoption. You mentioned that in certain instances, you shine a mirror on someone's actual activity and they their eyes might light up and say, oh, wow, I've been doing that. How do you then get the behavior to change? That is the hardest part, right? I mean, the math. I'm not saying I can do it, but there are lots of PhDs out there and, and very smart people who can do the math. The hard part is actually getting somebody to use the math to change their behavior. And different people are different, you know. So we have some clients who are 
super low turnover, like, you know, very long term and very, very deliberate in their process and, and make very few decisions. And that means that analyzing the data is kind of slow going. You do it once, it's not going to change by next month, right? But those people are often the sort who are very interested in codifying the investment process and using our asking nudges, as we call them, to record more information about why they're doing what they're doing. And in that way, go deeper on a smaller number of data points. We we have clients who do huge amounts of turnover as well. And those guys, they're doing, I don't know, 100 trades a day maybe. They're not going to answer a a nudge that asks them questions about why they're doing what they're doing. (laughs) It's a question of packaging the output of the analysis with a human, you know, it's, it's a human machine combo. The human is an ex fund manager and the, that ex fund manager comes and sits down with you and gets to know what your process is like and what your attention span is like and, and what you're really looking to get out of it and then tailor the service accordingly. Because if you don't engage with it and you don't use the information, the whole thing is pointless. For us, it's not just for you. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned your nudges. And I know we, we've talked about this in the past. And it's something that I, I found really interesting and, and really the second part of what we started talking about. So you now have the data. You've now figured out some things the portfolio manager maybe could do a little bit better. What are these nudges? So we have asking nudges and telling nudges. And the, the point of all of it is that there's too much information already out there. You can't expect anybody to actually pull anything in this day and age, really. Like, fund managers want to be served stuff. Ideally, they want to be disciplined, but they're not going to remember to do that. It's very rare that you find somebody who remembers to journal every night and do it exactly like this and, you know, do it in some way that's actually analyzable. I mean, even the best journalers are writing in a paper notebook a lot of the time, which is not helpful beyond the act of writing it down, really. Or it is, but it's very time consuming to go back over it. So what asking nudges do is they're, they're triggered by a passing of time or an event in the portfolio and they ask you questions. You just entered this name. Why did you do that? How long do you think you'll be here? What is your target price? You, you get to choose what the questions are because it doesn't work if the questions aren't relevant to you. You, you drop it like immediately if, if, we just asked you bog standard questions. So it has to be that these are things you've said you wanted to ask yourself because you know that down the road you want to be able to do analysis on whether we're better at this type of trade or that type or do we ever really make it to our price target or do we hold it twice as long as we think we're going to? You know, all of that sort of question. Those are things that we can answer if we start capturing the data at the point that you enter the position. We'll ask you for, for some people, we have a nudge that they answer every night. It's just a journaling prompt, and it says, what happened today? Might ask you a few questions about how productive were you or whatever. What names are you thinking about? What are you thinking about them? And that's, you know, the information you can keep to yourself. But the point is, if you mention the stock, whatever you say next is going to get pinned to the share price chart. And in that way, you can kind of dump your brain directly into a visual story of, of each idea as opposed to into a pile of notebooks that gather dust in your corner. So telling nudges are really about looking. So we get your daily trade and holdings, uh, you know, once we've done the historical analysis, if you sign up for the full insight service, we're, we take your daily trades and holdings. And based on the patterns we've observed in your behavior historically, we will send you a, a nudge once a week that says, here are the names you're currently holding that look like they're doing that, you know, whatever that is. What's an example of that? Well, it could be about exit timing. So it could be if you've had a tendency to hold on to losing for too long, what we can do is say, all right, here's a what could be a stop loss rule, sort of standard if the name underperforms by a certain amount without recovering by a certain amount. Let's apply that to historically every name in your portfolio, and then let's back test it and see at what point would you have been optimal in making a decision. And that decision could be to add, it could be to cut, you know, we'll test lots of different scenarios. And then sit down with you and say, okay, here's what we found. 
going forward, how about we send you this nudge and it's going to list the positions. It's going to tell you how many weeks in a row the name is, is on this list. And it's going to remind you what the optimal point was historically. But we're not telling you you have to sell or buy. We're just saying make a decision, click this link, and it's going to ask you a couple of questions. And you can say what the questions are, but it might be, would I be a buyer today? Or why are you still here? Or, you know, the things that you know you're supposed to be asking yourself at that point, but it's sort of inconvenient and it never ends up happening. And what we find is that people's behavior changes. So when you do that, people do make a better decision. And it's not because we've told them what decision to make. It's because we've told them to pause and be, make a decision whatever that decision is. You're the book fund manager, but this is the point where your unconscious bias would lead you to ignore the situation or, or try and think about something else. And we're saying, no, you know what? It's not nice, but you have to think about it now. So let's just do it. Um, and then we measure it. Yeah, it sounds like a forced activation of the you know, Danny Kahneman system two brain. Exactly, exactly. And then we can measure what happens. Like what trades do you do on the back of that? And how successful are they? And what we find is that they are more successful than your normal trades usually. That's very interesting. And that's how we end up proving our ROI. Because at that point, you say, look, we helped you save this much alpha. How much time has to pass or how much data do you have to gather before you start to get to a point where you think you have insights that can improve someone's performance? It's a question of how many trades, really. And, it, and we look for a minimum of 2,000 trades. So that could be as in trends. It doesn't have to be that you, you know, we're in and out of names that frequently. But for somebody who's very low turnover, that could be quite a, a long time. And for somebody who's long, short trader, that could be a month. If we think that you're not going to have enough data for that, but you're still interested in nudges, for example, we have a version of Accenture called Ascension Note that is basically for people who don't have enough data yet, but want to start capturing more about why. I imagine once you start, you start recording data, it's trade entry data and exit data. And now you start adding in these asking nudges, which is a whole different sort of data set. What's the most interesting data set that a portfolio manager has tried to get your help in assessing how they can improve their performance? The ones that are most interesting so far are ones where they're capturing a lot of data at the, about the entry context. So, you know, we've, we've decided to buy this name and we're recording what was Joe's view? What was Fred's view? What was Jane's view? You know, was this contentious? Was it unanimous? How does it fit on like management quality and valuation and franchise? You know, all the different things that you might be rating these things on anyway as part of your process, if we can get you to do that in a structured data format, then we can start to weave that into the analysis. And what we found so far is sometimes contentious decisions are the better decisions, for some people anyway. And, and for the first firm that we did this with, that was, that was the case, which was, and particularly around when, so when when they would vote unanimously on something, it was fine if they all trusted management. So there was like a link between management quality and unanimity, and that resulted in a good outcome. Whereas if you didn't have that management quality agreement and it was contentious, you were more likely to end up with a good outcome. So that's just like the beginning for something about that healthy debate that everybody talks about in their marketing and and it's hard to do. It's way harder than, than people let on. But doing that in a way that it doesn't get personal because you can see that the value that healthy debate adds is quantifiable and it's positive. It just means that you can do that much more freely. Once you've done a whole bunch of work with a portfolio manager or a firm, I'm kind of curious how consistent are the patterns. And if they are consistent and someone learns, oh, I tend to exit too early, I tend to exit too late, after a while, are they able to just embed that in their own process and change? And therefore, in some sense, you've done a nice service and, well, then they don't need you anymore. Right. 
what's fascinating and sort of unexpected to me, having analyzed a lot of different portfolio managers' data going back long, you know, periods of time in some cases, is that people's behavior is very stable. You know, so people will often say, well, I want you to, to go back 10 years because I think my behavior might have changed through different market cycles or whatever. And the reality is that we each have our dance moves and it doesn't matter what music's playing or what dance floor we're on, we still do the same dances. And some of those moves are awesome and you're really cool and some of them are really embarrassing and if you saw yourself in a mirror, you would stop doing that. But if you take the mirror, so I can show you the mirror and we can talk about like, okay, you might not want to do it quite like that, you know. You make a decision about about what you're going to do differently. But when we take the mirror away, you will start doing what you used to do. Because it's like, you know, it's very inbuilt and you've been doing it for years like that. So we have seen it happen where uh, clients put a lot of focus on, on a insight that we brought him to do actually, in his case, with exit timing. And, and then he started to improve and that was great. And then he moved on to something else and forgot all about the exit timing discipline and it, it reverted. And so we came back again and said, look, everything else is looking good, but that, that old exit timing thing has creeped back in. Should we have another look at it? And this time he was like, okay, this is my number one. 2017 is all about cell discipline. We are doing this. And he has killed it. He has completely changed his behavior. And it, he knows that, unfortunately, you can't then relax. But that's why technology nudging you makes it easy because you can't remember all this stuff all the time. You know, if you can just know that the tech is going to prompt you to make a decision when you need to make it, that's what the tech is good at. You're good at making the decision. So he's actually asking for more nudges at this point. He, he's like, great, I buy it. I know this works. Give me more. You know, show me my sale position. Show me my alpha decay. Show me, show me anything where you've noticed that I tend to make a, a lazy or a, a sort of unconscious and negative decision. What's the hardest part of convincing a portfolio manager or a team to become a client? I'd say every team has at least one person who's into this kind of thing. You know, there's always that person. And and often there's somebody in the head of equities or the CIO role who loves this idea and is like, you know, we need data-driven feedback with, so we know how to allocate our energy and we want to prove it in our marketing material that we're skilled and blah, blah, blah. There will sometimes be one guy who's really struggling on performance, and that's the one that they decide that we're going to do a pilot with. That's not a good call, unfortunately. If you are going to do that, also have to do it with somebody who's doing well, because that guy's under a lot of pressure already. He knows he's performing badly. He may or may not take well to having yet more noses in his business. Then you also will have people who... They're just never going to be up for it. You know, a lot of my old colleagues from back in the day, I love them dearly, but they're like, Claire, don't even, <laughs> don't even tell me about this. I don't want to know. Like, I don't, I've been doing it the same way for 25 years. And if I lift the lid on it now, like, God help me. And it's like, you know what? Fine. I'm not going to try and sell to you, but I am going to find out who the young person on your team is who's really, uh, you know, the next gen, and I'm going to sell to that person. And then also, I'm going to give, if the champion, so just talking to a client this morning where a very old school, long only firm that the head of research is really into it, but he's like, you know, how, how do I get buy-in? I need your help getting buy-in. And we've been through this so many times now that we we can see exactly what we're dealing with and, and know how to just you do it's like a kaizen approach very small very slow you know it it takes a while but it can be done if you have data proof you have to start with the data proof and then continuously feed them more data proof so it's not a matter of opinion it seems like all the, these tools start in the equity world probably not surprising because there is a lot of data and a lot of trade data and you mentioned down the road, being able to extend it past equities. Where are we in that time horizon? And what do you think is next on the frontier? The most logical starting point for us will be futures, because a lot of equity managers trade futures also. And that's relatively straightforward. The things that make futures complicated are more operational than anything else. There's a ton of demand from fixed income 
and fixed income is, is very interesting because it's an area where, you know, active management, there's a strong argument for active management continuing to add value, and we'd love to, to address it. The hard part is figuring out how you judge a, a good fixed income decision. You know, and a good equity decision is typically, I'm buying it because I think it's going up, or I'm shorting it because I think it's going down. And it might be a relative value thing, but at the end of the day, that's how it works. Fixed income, you buying something, it's like you're throwing something into a witch's brew and it's you're buying it because it's going to do something to the bigger brew. And, and that could be a lot of different things. We're sort of taking a step back and looking at it more fundamentally and saying, well, hang on a second, is there a simpler way of doing this rather than reinventing the wheel on, on doing all those sort of risk calculations and, and curve generation? So now that you've looked at all these data sets, mostly in the equity world, we know how hard it is already to just beat the market by picking stocks. We're compounding mm-hmm. that with the individual behavioral biases that don't help. As mm-hmm. you've looked at all the data, you've worked with some teams to improve what they're doing. How optimistic or pessimistic are you about active management? I'm very optimistic. Charlie Ellis is the non-exec director of my company. So <laughs> you know, there are plenty of people in my life who, are, who, are, who feel the, the opposite, except even Charlie would say, I never said there wouldn't be active managers. I said there would be fewer of them. And so I'm very optimistic for the few that will go on. And a lot of active managers will leave because it is getting so much harder to have a competitive advantage. But the ones who have this behavioral alpha advantage, you know, where they actually are looking at their own behavior and saying, I want to continuously improve like an athlete and I want to look at at data to help me do that. There's low hanging fruit there. Even just pitting them against other fund managers, there's low hanging fruit. And, And all it takes is the will to face the truth, the, the sort of Ray Dalio approach about like mankind needs to be honest with itself about what works and what doesn't work and what is true and what is not true. And if you're willing to do that, you do have an advantage. Some people will never be willing to do it. So I, I mean, I see managers, it's like I look at x-rays all day long of different managers and I see a lot of skill. It's quite rare that I see somebody where you're like, oh, God, you should really find a different occupation. <laughs> you know? Usually there's something to work with. And then it's all about how do I help that person do more of the thing they're good at and, and stop getting in their own way on, on those other things. All right, Claire, we're going to turn to some closing questions. What was your favorite sports moment? My favorite sports moment is any moment where the underdog wins because they've used data. Moneyball, great. You know, I love Moneyball. That formed a big part of my thinking in Accenture. But probably my favorite, most recent one would be when Leicester City won the Premier League in soccer in, in the UK. I guess it was a couple of years ago now. But but they had been nowhere. They had been third division, like not of interest to anybody really, and had only entered the Premier League a year before that. And they were literally a 5,000 to one shot. and yet. They won, and there's lots of theories about why that is, but one of the central ones that comes up over and over is that they cared about data science, and they had players logging data, you know, on their tablets, and they they did a lot of analysis that was quite like what we do around entries and exits and ads and trends, where they look at what happened just before you, you entered, what happened just before you kicked the ball, and what happened just after you kicked the ball, what happened to you and what happened to the ball. And that kind of analysis, I think, led them to have an advantage. And it also helped them to recruit talent, you know, in the money ball style that, that was cheaper that nobody else was paying attention to that ended up winning the day. So it was a huge deal in the UK. And it was one of those sort of underdog winning heartfelt stories. Yeah, fantastic. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Do a job properly or don't do it at all. You know, if you can't figure out how to do it properly, find out how to do it. If you can't find out, do something else <laughs> because you're wasting your time. In the Flynn household, half ass jobs were not allowed. And I, as a result, work that way myself. I have very high standards. It does mean that, you know, people have to work quite hard at attention, but mistakes are allowed. They're just not to be repeated. And, and laziness is not allowed. What information do you read that you get a lot out of that other people might not know about? 
Well, as you know, I am a podcast junkie. So it's, it's, I probably get more out of the stuff I listen to than the stuff I read. I do. I read a lot of books that you would see on reading lists that you're aware of. But my favorites are podcasts that I listen to. While I'm so talking. outside of Capital Allocators, um, what's your favorite podcast? <laughs> I'm listening to things about behavioral economics or entrepreneurship or the crossover between technology and humanity because these are just things I'm interested in. And the ones that I will reach to first, how I built this, which is an interview with the entrepreneurs who I just love. And it, I think it's interesting, even if you're not an entrepreneur, but true, true stories. And then Note to Self, which is about technology and humanity and, and sort of they delve into wearable technologies a lot. They talk about privacy issues and children on social media and all that kind of stuff. I think they're fantastic. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? Well, I've learned that failure is not only an option, but it's a necessity in life. And I think I was taught quite young that failure is not an option. And you do not give up and you do not, you know... The problem with that, of course, and, and being an overachieving kid, you know, and those of us who are parents are now able to, to be conscious of this, is that when the kid finally fails, or, you know, maybe they're an adult by then, it hurts a lot. <laughs> you know, it's a bit of a rude awakening. And actually, through my work at Essentia, this has all become much more clear to me that, that if you start thinking about things in terms of feedback loops, then failure becomes a very valuable learning experience. And it gets easier and easier to separate the emotion of failing, you know, or, or getting something wrong from the learning and recognize the emotion for what it is. You can, don't try to make it go away because it's going to show up somewhere else anyway. But recognize it for what it is and then have a rational conversation with yourself about what did I actually learn from that? What will I do differently next time? If you don't have those, then you can't do that, and, and learning becomes very difficult. All right, last one. It's your waning days. The active management industry is thriving because you've been nudging people for however many decades at this point in time. You are in your rocking chair. What advice would you give yourself today? I would probably advise myself to store some stem cells now. <laughs> <laughs> Something that has been on my list for ages and I have not done it and I I can see myself in a rocking chair kicking myself for not having done that so I'm going to get on it <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the nudge <laughs> <laughs> great fun Claire thank you so much for taking the time it was great to talk to you and now we turn from the nitty gritty of trade execution to the construction of portfolios with Cameron Height. Cameron thanks for joining me thanks for coming by absolutely thanks for having me Ted why don't we start with your background and how you got to founding Alpha Theory? I uh, graduated from UNC Chapel Hill, and then I moved up to New York where I was an equity analyst for uh, CIBC, then DLJ, and then Lehman Brothers. So I was on the equity side during the heyday of the dot-com boom. I then was hired away by one of the funds that I was a client of. There I became an uh, equity analyst for a hedge fund, long-short equity fund, that led me to find the problems that Alpha Theory tries to solve. And what are those problems? Well, I think it's something that is not just specific to investing. I think it's something that's specific to all forms of decision making is that we take things that are generally implicit and we use them to make decisions when we're better off taking things that are implicit, making them explicit, using those explicit assumptions with a set of rules to make better decisions. And so... Let me dive in just a little yeah. bit there. So... What's implicit and what's explicit in that definition? Yeah, so let me give you an example for investors. So imagine I'm a, an analyst walking to my portfolio manager's office and and we're talking about investing in a security and I believe that uh, I tell him, you know, I think this stock has a lot of upside. It's got a great management team, not a lot of downside. He's kind of a liquid, so we have to be aware of that. You know, hey, portfolio manager, try and size that position. There's a lot of implicit information that I've given him. And so if I could translate implicit information into explicit assumptions, then we can be better off. So if I, instead of saying I have a lot of upside, I'd say 
I have 60% of upside. Or I say, I don't have a lot of downside. I say 20% of downside because my portfolio manager could have interpreted a lot of upside as 120% or 30%. There's a great quote by Richard Schuer who wrote uh, The Psychology of Intelligence Analysis where he says that objectivity is gained by making assumptions explicit so that they can be examined and challenged. It's one of my favorite quotes because it is the essence of what we try and do. We try and help firms take a lot of the bias and emotion of the decision-making process out so that they can make better decisions. And what are the mistakes that you see portfolio managers make? Step one is, is really that sort of Im- implicit, explicit translation. Then um, setting rules around those things. So if I set rules for how I want to size a position, how I want to think about liquidity, how I want to think about risk reward, I need them to be explicit so that I can actually follow them. But even if they are explicit, what we find is a lot of times people override the rules that they've set in advance. And I think that there's enough cognitive science studies, psychological studies that show that experts really aren't good at making decisions in general. Political pundits on who's going to be elected or wine experts on uh, what's a great vintage or an oncologist on who is most likely to get cancer. And so these are people that are experts that spent their whole life studying these things. And so as an example, let's say the oncologist study. The oncologists were asked to tell the psychologist What's important to you when you try to determine how long someone's going to live with cancer? And they will say, you know what I care about? I care about, you know, if I'm looking at the x-ray, I want to see the, the tumor, the perimeter, how far it's spread, its size, the age of the patient, T-cell count. And I'm not a doctor, so I can't give you the litany of things that they care about. But they're going to give you this litany of things that they care about. And what the psychologists do is they go off to the side and they take all of the attributes that the oncologist said were really important and they come up with a simple algorithm that, that weights them all equally and says, okay, we're going to forecast how long someone's going to live based on the criterion that was set up by the oncologist themselves. And then they have the oncologist just using the information they said was important also forecast how long that person's going to live. And guess what? The little algorithm that the psychologist built over to the side wins every time. They've done hundreds, maybe even thousands of these studies now And the little simple algorithm wins every time. So, you know, one of the biggest mistakes that we find is that people like to use their mental calculator to make decisions when ultimately the little simple model that they built is far superior to what they've done in their head. Right. So when you take that framework and apply it to portfolio construction, what is the tool that Alpha Theory is providing to portfolio managers? Largely what we're doing is we're, we're a toolkit. We're, we're trying to allow portfolio managers to do what they're doing already. But trying to take those implicit assumptions, we capture a lot of those implicit assumptions and allow them to make them explicit inside of our system. So those things can be something as simple as how much do I believe I can make if I'm right? How much I could lose if I'm wrong? What are the probabilities of those things occurring? And I think that your last couple of podcasts, you had a Mobison on, you had Andy Duke on. One of the things that they found of paramount importance and they kept coming back to was expected value or coming up with ways of using probabilistic expectations to come up with the decisions that people should make. And so what we do is we want to capture that and make the implicit explicit and then allow them to find other things that they deem important. It can be a checklist of items. So how good is the management, what the rate, the, how good the management team is, or how good is the balance sheet? And for each of our clients, it's different. But taking those implicit assumptions, making them explicit, and then allowing a portfolio manager to set rules for how they want to translate explicit information into decisions. That decision inside of a portfolio is going to be, what's a position size? A 0% position size is still a decision. It's deciding not to do something. But taking assumptions that are implicit, making them explicit inside of our system, setting rules, and then allowing those rules to dictate how we size positions in a portfolio. You point out where there's discrepancies between what you said you wanted to do a priori and what you're actually doing. And those incongruous situations are the ones where you either have to, as a portfolio manager, say, yep, I need to trade, or I need to reassess my assumptions. What have you found changes in the sort of portfolio manager's implementation 
once they're using alpha theory compared to when they aren't? It runs the gambit. So we will walk into a new fund that we start working with, and they already have a lot of this philosophy embedded in their, their mentality. So codifying that is relatively straightforward. Then we'll have others where a lot of this is greenfield for them. And so we're asking questions that, as a firm, they know they should have been asking, but they haven't been. And so a lot of it is the big gains that they get from starting to use alpha theory is the, the initial phase where they try and come up with a similar vernacular and standardization for how they make decisions. And a lot of those questions are really enlightening for them. And so for both firms, once they get to the point where they have a process in place, it starts to become refinement over time. There's an evolution. Just like I said before, people like to override the system because we have empirical evidence that proves out if it works or not. We can then get them more comfortable with making decisions using the model they built in advance instead of overriding it. And how do you find people balance that you've put a system in place and it's based on explicit assumptions, but even the forecasts, the assumptions aren't going to be that precise. So there's this balance between, okay, we're going to stick with the model and, oh no, we're still going to override it because our intuition is telling us that something's off with the model. That's probably one of the biggest challenges that people realize that the inputs into the system are just good guesses and sometimes they're not even good. What we're doing is we're saying, hey, take this information that you know isn't quite right and use it to make decisions. Well, that's a hard thing to, on paper, look at and say, I'm going to do that. But let's recognize, let's look at the counterfactual. What are we doing already? As a portfolio manager without the system, we're doing the exact same thing. We're already taking that information in and we're processing it mentally and it's implicit and we believe that our mental calculator is better at taking those ambiguities and refining them so that they come up with better results. But really, honestly, we're not. Let's recognize this is a garbage in, garbage out system either way. If garbage goes into alpha theory in our case or goes into the portfolio manager's head in the heuristic kind of case, either way it's garbage in. And so I believe that what happens is by making things explicit, you can objectively analyze and challenge the assumptions that you're making. Because you know if I come in and I say it's got a lot of upside, you know it's a lot different than saying it's eight times 2018 EBITDA of 500 million. We clearly recognize that, and most fund managers are already doing that. I think one of the great things that Mulvison always talks about is the outside view. Then what you want to do is then take some of that and you know compare that to what's the historical highest multiple this thing is ever traded at, and what is the industry trading at, and have this outside view to really give a portfolio manager a way of sort of creating a foundation for how they're making those decisions. And as Portfolio managers implement this. What have you found? You've been doing this for 10 years. So what have you found in terms of outcomes? Overall, what we found is that just like in the expert studies, people would have done better off if they had followed the model that they built. And it works out about 75% of the time that clients would have been better off if they would have followed the model they built instead of what they actually did. So that's once they hired you and they're using the model, they're still not quite following. Yeah, we have correlation statistics that actually show the correlation between the model that they built we call it optimal position size, and what they actually do. And the discrepancies can be different for different clients. Some of them are very highly correlated, you know, 98%, and then others are have, have wide gaps. What we found over time is that, number one, our clients in general outperform others. So we only have six years worth of data, but going back- And that universe is long short equity? It's primarily 86% of our clients are long short equity. And, that, and US focused or not necessarily? Uh, we have a few Hong Kong, few- Uh, London, a few Canadian. But what we found is that our clients over the past six years, which is as far back as we have data, have outperformed the equity hedge index every single one of those years. There's a either it's part of that's alpha theory. I'd like to believe that. But part of it is just they're process oriented to begin with. And I believe that people that are process oriented generally outperform. But then for each of those six years, our clients would have done better each of those six years if they would have followed the model that they built. With every, consistency. With consistency. Every single year. Every single year they would have done better. And so there's a huge gap. I mean, let's recognize, I keep going back to Mobison, but he's talking about paradox of skill. And so there's a lot of really smart people out there looking at the same thing. So finding really good ideas is 
incredibly challenging right now. The edge that we find a lot of time actually needs to come from better position sizing and not from better stock selection because stock selection is so hard. It's just maximizing the value that you can capture from the research that you perform. I was always astounded. I've, we met a long time ago, and I remember looking at Alpha Theory pretty early on. I was always astounded at how simple the tool was. And you could look at it and say, well, I should be able to do this on my own. <laughs> and yet, yeah. to your point, like people don't. I remember when I was uh, explaining to my family for the first time, like I was leaving the hedge fund that I was working for, and I was going to start Alpha Theory. I was trying to explain to everyone what I was doing. And my grandmother said to me, you mean they're not doing this already? And it's <laughs> your grandmother. <laughs> yeah, my grandmother. It's like it's like, and it's really hard to disabuse people of the fact that very smart people that are making millions and some of them billions of dollars a year have these huge gaps in their decision making process. But it's not uncommon. I mean, look at sports and Moneyball. Moneyball's been around. I don't know how long. Twenty five. I don't know. You you probably know better than I. How long it's been around? Not that old. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to look it, it up. It, well, I'm just talking about when Billy Bean started oh, implementing yeah. it at yeah. so Saber Metrics and Billy Bean implementing yeah, it's it at A's. Years. The gaps still persist in baseball. Not everyone has adopted these empirically proven rules that make us make better decisions. Football is still coming along, and hockey and soccer, all of the sports where it should have should have changed. And Michael Lewis has a great quote where he talks about the ossification of industries, where things that have been going along for decades and sometimes centuries, like baseball, there's a dogma that gets created, and people assume that the dogma is correct because everybody believes it. And so it's challenging that dogma. And the dogma for our world is that portfolio managers are these savants that can consume large amounts of information and translate it into great decisions that no one else can do. And there may be people that are, and I'm not questioning that, but I don't think that the large majority of us are. I think what we're generally good at and people that are in this profession have grown up being great analysts. We're really good at finding good stocks and digging in and finding out their economic value and what's their potential risks on the downside and how good is the man. That's what we're really good at. Translating that information into a portfolio, I don't think we really have a lot of skills there. So let's use computers and let's use rule sets to help us do a better job. This notion of disaggregating the security analysis from portfolio construction is one that you know comes up and you can look at it. On the long only world, you have certain high active share managers that may only have 10 or 15 stocks. And then you have the sort of index hugging mutual funds of old that have low tracking error. And one is really about stock selection. One's about portfolio construction. On the hedge fund side, you have the long short equity fund. That's the one you described that's focused on analysis. And then you have kind of the platform firms, the millennium the old SAC, your point seventy two now, that we're really f focused more on risk management and portfolio construction. In your work with a variety of different clients, have you seen sort of differences in a certain manager or firm is a great analytical firm in picking stocks? Another one may or may not be that great at picking stocks, but makes up for it in their skill in portfolio construction. I will have to say that my perspective is limited. So uh, I don't have a lot of experience working with, let's say, a macro manager, which, you know, those, those are the folks that are generally associated with being really great traders, like a Paul Tudor Jones. Or There could be a lot of that. What I typically end up, the people that are attracted to what we're doing are the people that are, you know, have a scientific mindset. They end up being those that have the fundamental background and come out of that analyst mold and are trying to be better portfolio managers. So I wish I had a great perspective there. I don't know that I have seen anyone that I could empirically prove that they're just really great position sizers or they're really good at overriding the system. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. I don't think I've found that yet. Remember, there's a selection bias in, in our clients. What we have found, though, is that we can find people that are really good stock pickers. And we can measure that in a few different ways. You can 
you can do it based on their forecast for where they believe the stock's going to go. And I'm just measuring what actually happens in the future. We have that kind of data because we have a lot of, we have 135,000 price target forecast across our history to be able to analyze how good are analysts. And so we can actually tease some of that out using, we actually use Briar scores to using some of the stuff that we learned out of, after reading Phil Tetlock's super forecasting. What makes a, or, or what is a good stock picker? We also can sort of just say, is the portfolio manager good at figuring out the assets in his portfolio, his or her portfolio, that are most likely to outperform? And the way that we measure that is something simple as saying, we take the top 10 positions compared to 10 through 20, 20 through 30, and just say, is the batting average higher for the top 10 versus the next 10 versus the next 10? If we take their forecast and say, is the highest expected returns, do those outperform, those top 10s outperform the next 10, outperform the next 10? And what we can find, we can sort of point to the managers that have that skill. It's been enlightening and we can reflect back to our clients where they can make improvements in their process because we can point out things like, on average, your upsides are too aggressive, but your downsides are about in line. And overall, your probability, for instance, our clients on average assume that they'll make money 74% of the time. That's basically, they forecast an array of scenarios, and we can pick the scenarios that are forecasted to make money, and we just add up the probabilities associated with those scenarios. On average, our clients assume they're going to be right 74% of the time. But guess what? They're only right 51% of the time. So there's a big gap, and we can point out those gaps. We call it probability inflation. And what our clients are able to do is to rectify that the next go-round. The next time they're making forecasts, they can come up with more conservative probability assessments, which ends up creating portfolios which are uh, skewed less towards risky assets. And so these are good things that you can get from empirical evidence and you know it goes along with feedback mechanisms that make great great athletes you can't be a great athlete without great feedback you know it's kind of the 10,000 hours thing we're giving them feedback to help them hone their skill be it price target forecasting being probability forecasting being position sizing and understanding the inputs of their process that actually matter to them and one of the things that you just mentioned was that if People have a, a bias towards being right in their probability assessment and can adjust that. They'd have a less risky portfolio. You've also written a piece called the Concentration Manifesto that almost argues for the opposite of that in some sense, uh, depending on how you define risk in the portfolio. So why don't you talk about what your research has shown you and what the Concentration Manifesto is all about. Yeah, so at a high level, what the Concentration Manifesto is, is that active management is under immense pressure, and a big part of that is self-induced because either fees are too high to get over the hurdle of the performance that they generate. And, you know, they do generate alpha. It's just the alpha is not high enough to get over the fees. It's also self-induced because we've been told by the people giving us money, either an institutional allocator or retail allocator, that we need to be diversified. We need to control risk as a portfolio manager. But once again, it goes back to what I was saying before. We're trained to be great analysts, and generally we can pick good stocks. So what we've found, going back to that example that I gave before, is that if you look at a fund's top 10 positions, those for our clients at least, and a lot of other academic studies. I know that Novus um, did some research here as well. The top 10 positions outperformed the next 10, outperformed the next 10. And so for our clients, it ended up being, you know, I said the batting average for our clients was right around 51%. This is on an alpha adjusted basis. So the top 10 positions was 57%, next 10 was 55, next 10 was 52. And then it went into, right after 30, it sort of went into randomness. Basically, it was a coin flip if you were picking a good stock or not. And so my premise is this. If we as active managers want to survive, we need to do what we're good at, which is picking good stocks and not diluting ourselves with portfolios of 100 plus stocks. If we can pick 30 good positions, 30 may not be the, there's no magic number here. It's going to be different for different folks. But just just say 30. And then we can generate alpha that way. Yes, there are risk inherent in creating a portfolio of 30 stocks. But typically, our clientele is not investing in just our fund. 
the risk mitigation that they may that we may have wanted to create they can create themselves by investing in multiple different funds with different attributes and so what i would get is is if i am an let's say i'm an institutional investor and i basically have an array of funds right now that are generating 51% batting averages and then i could just say Nope, all of you guys go to your 30 best positions, and all of a sudden the batting average goes to 57% across all of them. I don't dilute that batting average for any of them. I still get a 57% batting average, but I can create the diversification effect by investing in multiple different managers. So it's a beautiful concept. Here's the challenge, though, is that there's business risk for the hedge fund manager that takes on this strategy because they inherently could have could have taken on bigger positions they have a higher likelihood of losing more money and dogma which we we're talking about before for the allocator is that that's not typically what we do we invest in people that are thinking about risk and so a lot of there needs to be a conversation between managers and allocators to get on the same page so that this kind of evolution in our industry can happen it's better for the managers it's better for the allocators, and it will be the kind of thing that can save active managers. I just want to be clear about this 51%. I want to make sure I understand this. So when you're talking about a batting average, what is the math behind that calculation? Yeah, it's super simple. We take, let's say you have 100 positions. How many of them made money? Net of the benchmark. So how many of them how many outperformed? Lo- lost money? net of the benchmark. And so 51 out of the 100 positions in our average client. And uh, that's both the long side and the short side. Yeah, we together. look at it both ways. Okay. It, does, it, does, it doesn't end up mattering too much. We actually came up with this concept of size-weighted batting. And it's very similar to the AUM-based performance, alpha generation, So, which showed that active managers were able to contribute more net alpha If you don't look look at an average, you look at it on a size-weighted basis. This is something that we also found across our clients is that that batting average, when we just take and multiply, basically we're just summing up the total exposure that made money versus the total exposure that lost money. It actually goes to 54.4% from 51%. And what that basically is saying is going back to the concentration manifesto, there's a lot of little small positions that they're losing money on that they shouldn't have in their portfolio in the first place. Are your clients, you, you mentioned 86%, is that primarily long, short equity managers? And what, what's in the other 14%? And where else could you apply this tool? So I'm Long only managers. It's just that our background is, I came out of a hedge fund. Uh, a lot of my friends work for hedge funds. And so our initials were clientele, were those folks. And it's a network effect. They tell other people and they happen to be hedge fund managers. But I actually think that this is m- what we're doing a lot of times is more applicable to a long only manager because they end up having a larger stable of analysts working for them. And they have less of a conversation sometimes between that. And just imagine uh, Newberger for example. They have a large number of analysts and they have portfolio managers that don't directly control those analysts, unlike a hedge fund. And so the information flow and making things explicit is so much more important in that process. And they end up having a lot more rules as well. And so there's a there's a good fit for that. It's just haven't had as many conversations with yeah. mutual fund managers. Have you had any conversations with credit managers and, and distressed debt managers? Yeah, I mean, this is this is decision-making 101. It's what we're doing. You could apply to uh, ma- trying to buy a house or, you know, should I take a new job? This is all applicable. And, yes, we have had some high yield distress guys that have said this is something that we're working with a few right now to vet that idea. But it's the same. You're still coming up with, you know, the upside may be par, Instead of something, it actually, in some ways, it's better because your expectations are a lot more discreet. You know, you kind of know what your upside is. You kind of know what your downside is. And the probabilities are still a little fuzzy, but, you know, the assumptions going in are a lot better. If you turn the table a little bit and think of this from an allocator's perspective, what questions should allocators be asking of managers they're interviewing that would indicate whether they're sort of navigating this well or not. You were an allocator for a long time, and you asked a lot of these questions. And the question is, how do you size positions? Every allocator asks that question. And 
portfolio managers are well trained to say that what we do is we're constantly looking at risk reward. We're, we're evaluating that. We're making sure that our best ideas are our biggest positions. We want to evaluate management teams and constantly looking at risk and, and other portfolio factors and trying to make sure that we're not in too crowded bets and looking at exposure analysis. And they just, when you, when you walk through it that way, it sounds great. But how do you do it? And really the question that an allocator could ask is say, hey, what's your sixth best idea? And pause and wait for them to tell you what their sixth best idea is. Now, if they can turn to a sheet or a dashboard or something like that that says, that's my sixth best idea adjusted for all the things that I care about, which are going to be risk reward, drawdown risk, liquidity, all those kinds of things. I can look down my list and say, this is my sixth best idea right now because things change. If they can tell you that, they can manage their portfolio effectively because they can make sure that their best ideas are their biggest positions, their 16th best ideas, their 16th largest position. But if they can't quickly tell you, they don't have somewhere to turn. And if they can't answer that question in five minutes, there's a hole in their process. How much does the optimization of the inputs of the tool reacting to the just dynamism of markets or stock price movements end up driving kind of the efficiency of portfolio construction. So you have your assumptions. The assumptions might not change, but stock prices are moving and managers trade around a little bit every day. And the question is, are they making the right trades? We find managers should be trading around positions more. They're generally not. And the positions that's easiest to ignore is the one that's working and making you money. And so what happens in that situation is the price is going up, which means the position size is going up as a, as a percentage of your total assets under management. And so let's say a 5% position has now grown to a 7% position. But what also happens to the expected return in that case? The expected return goes the opposite direction, all else being equal. Let's just say that our price target was 100. The stock's gone from 50 to 70. So the expected upside has gone down. The expected downside has gone up. And clearly something's changed. Maybe the probabilities of upside or downside, but Clearly, you can reset those expectations, but the expected return in some ways has gone down while our position size is going up. Managers in general should be trading more because there's a big reversion to the mean factor in the market. Yeah, it's a tricky one because it's easy to embrace the notion that trading creates transactions costs and therefore people should trade less and this is just movement around stock prices on a path. What other research have you been able to do based on the data that you're receiving from doing this a long time, and, and what has that shown you? One of the things that we did is we wanted to see if our clients that used our system more frequently were better performers. One of the simple things that we did was just say, all right, let's carve out the positions of all of our clients and put them into two buckets. One bucket's going to be positions where they took the time to come up with a price target. The other bucket's going to be positions they didn't take the time to come up with a price target. Well, guess what? The ones with price targets outperformed the ones without price targets. And it was a huge margin. It's basically 7% was the return on invested capital for positions with price targets. 1% was the return on invested capital for positions without price targets. And again, that's that's those are alpha percentages? No, it's just pure return on okay. invested capital. Yep. Yeah. It's such a simple rule that a firm can implement where we have enough data that should say, if you don't take the time to put in a price target, don't put the position on. Then we went to and said, okay, well, let's think about that a little bit further. We have a little bit of other data for our clients where we can break them down into the people, like I mentioned before, most correlated. So how closely do they follow the model? What's the percentage of coverage of price targets in their portfolio? And how fresh are those price targets? So if they haven't updated in 90 days, it starts to get to the point where we call it uh, you know, stale. What percentage of their portfolio has been updated in the last 90 days? So we take those three metrics correlation, coverage, and freshness. And we scored them equally and quartiled our clients and said the best actors, second best actors, third and worst. And then we just did return on invested capital for each of those. And it was, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but it's going to be directionally accurate. The top was around 9% return on invested capital. The second was like seven. The next was like three. The bottom was like zero. And there is a distinct correlation, at least in our small sample size. Once again, keeping in mind the small sample size, a distinct correlation between process 
and performance. What's been the biggest challenge in running this business? Changing human behavior. I don't think that we go into too many meetings where people sit across the table from us and they say, this thing that you're proposing that we do is a bad idea and not something we should do. Almost uniformly, they all agree that this is something that they should probably do, with alpha theory or not. They should definitely create some more process around how they make decisions in general. But I sort of equate it to a gym membership. Everyone knows that going to the gym or working out or whatever you want to, whatever way you want to analogize it, it is important to our health and our well-being and our happiness and all of these things. And we have three different groups of people. There's the people that say, yep, that's a great point. I'm going to sign up for your gym and they're going to go. Great. Those are the people we're looking for. Then there's going to be the other people that are aspirational and they're going to say, yeah, it's a great idea. I'm going to sign up for your gym. They go. They try it out. It doesn't quite stick. It's behavior. They stop going and they cancel their membership. And then there's the third group of people that just know up front, I'm not going to do this. And even though they know they should, they still don't. Most of us overeat at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Why is that? We know we shouldn't, but we still do it. We're humans. And so I think that's probably the biggest challenge. I think I went into this a bit Pollyannish, understanding, and my belief was that you build it, they will come. Because it is a concept when said out loud, it is, yeah, duh, we should do that. But that's not the way humans work. I think that uh, I was speaking at a conference a few months ago and Daniel Kahneman was the keynote and somebody asked a question about him and his career. And he said, it actually took like a cynical turn because he said one of his biggest disappointments is that all of these cognitive biases that he has exposed with the, you know, and others have exposed over the years, they really haven't made that much of a difference. And his point was that just knowing about a bias doesn't change human behavior. That's what we're doing in a lot of ways. It's just trying to iron out the noise, help firms put process into place to help them make the decisions they said they wanted to make in the first place. All right, Cameron, time for some closing questions. What is your favorite sports moment? Favorite sports moment. I am so glad that you asked. I'm a huge Carolina basketball fan. I went to... Wearing Carolina blue today. Yes, I am. I normally wear my Carolina belt. I didn't today. We play Duke tomorrow. I grew up 30 minutes from Chapel Hill. Went to school there. And uh, I remember probably two different times. 93, we won the national championship. I was in my, my mom's den with a bunch of my buddies from high school. And we drove up to Chapel Hill, went to Franklin Street and celebrated. That's probably, you know, hands down my favorite sports memory. But I was in Phoenix last year for the win over Gonzaga, which was being there and actually see it happen was was pretty stellar too. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I have two amazing parents. They are both very happy And uh, I don't think that it's anything necessarily that they taught me through verbalization, but it's more through following their lead. They're they're both selfless people, and they put others first. You know, you don't really know how that leads to happiness, but I clearly have seen that in them, that putting others first makes them happy. And I try and be, quote-unquote, a nice guy. And a big part of that is what I've seen and experienced from my parents. What information do you read that you get a lot out of that other people might not know about? I mean, I knew this question was coming, and I couldn't even think of anything. <laughs> and the, 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 the funny thing is, I'm, I'm such a, I'm a follower when it comes to information. And there's a uh, Tim Ferriss, I think it's Tim Ferriss, where he talks about you have a rule of three before you read a book. You hear it from three different people that you trust before you read a book. And that's kind of the way that I do everything. And I, I, I do read a broad array of things. And so it's not specific information from one place, but I'll read about physics or historical fiction or just a history book or about AI or you know, a ton of cognitive science books, investing books, business books. And so I try and have a wide array, a, a renaissance kind of mindset. I'd say that's probably the most important thing that I have from a learning standpoint, from an information standpoint, but I wish I had some, some great source, but I don't. What lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? 
we're type A people and we go a million miles a minute and we have no spare time, it's to try and slow down and enjoy more. I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. And so when people that are older than me tell me that it goes by so fast, I mean, I can't tell you, every parent has had a hundred different people say, enjoy every minute you can, it goes by so fast. And when you're living in the moment, you can't appreciate that. You really just can't. And so what I try and do is honor their opinions because when you hear it so many times from people that have been there, you have to take it at face value and, and believe that it's an objective fact, sort of a tangent, but it kind of reminds me of people always say that as I get older, time just seems to fly. And I think it's an effect of our denominators growing. I remember when I was five years old, a year seemed like forever, you know, because it's one fifth of my life. Now I'm 40, a, a year, I can't believe how fast 2017 went by. It's one fortieth of my life. So there's a denominator effect which changes our perspective. All right, it's your waning years. Active managers now rule the roost because they've all been using alpha theory. You're sitting back in your rocking chair. What advice would you give yourself today? It'd be a lot of the same. I think it would be it'd be slow down. I think that what I found is that as I've had kids and as I have gotten really busy with alpha theory. I've lost touch with a lot of the friends that I hold dear, and I think that I will look back uh, as a person sitting in my rocking chair and say to myself, did you make a mistake there? You need to, need to honor those relationships and, and put the time. I mean, every relationship requires an investment, marriage, your kids, your friends, your family, and uh, have you invested enough in that? Because those are the things that really pay dividends when you're sitting in that rocking chair. Cameron, thanks so much. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. Hey, before you take off, I've started sending out a monthly email that shares a small selection of what caught my eye over the month. I get a lot of emails like this, and I'm sure you do too, so I'm only going to send no more than a handful of the very best things that caught my eye. If you'd like to receive that email, hop on my website at capitalallocatorspodcast.com and join the mailing list. 